Hello everybody and welcome to Nathan on Shuffle and to this my latest top five video. This is the series where I talk about top five of a particular topic in progressive rock or music in general. These are generated by my wife who comes up with these topics week by week and I'm here to give my top five basically off the top of my head of what I come up with for the topic that she's given to me. So it's it's a little bit of a of an improvisational type experience. I'm just giving my opinions off the top of my head. Hopefully you guys enjoy that style and I would be thrilled for you guys to contribute in the comments below your top five lists of what you think for this particular topic. Please subscribe if you haven't yet. I do this every Tuesday. I do a top five video where we talk about the top five in a particular topic and it'd be fun to build the prog community and get more opinions about what I may be missing in my list here, so it's always fun to get music recommendations or to hear about bands or artists or albums that I didn't know about in the comments. So you guys are always so knowledgeable and so helpful in that regard. So hopefully this is a fun series for you. And this is an interesting topic. I struggled a little bit with this one, so my choices may be a bit uh, stretching it a, a little bit, but the topic is non-prog albums by prog musicians. So I thought this was an interesting topic. Uh, really, I often think of it the reverse way of, of thinking of prog albums by non-prog musicians, which may be a topic in the future. But in this regard, we're talking about prog musicians who came out with an album uh, that isn't classified as progressive rock, or I wouldn't classify it as progressive rock for whatever reason. Maybe they were trying to branch out and do something a little bit different. Maybe they just evolved their sound to a different direction based on the times. But the first one I wanted to mention is Stephen Wilson and his recent solo album, The Future Bites, which maybe received a bit of controversy at the time because it was him moving farther and farther away from the progressive rock that people had come to love, especially on his solo records, Raven Who Refused to Sing and uh, Hand Cannot Erase, which were really big progressive rock records. To the Bone kind of started this trend and The Future Bites really embraced this more 80s style synth pop sort of sound, which threw a lot of people off, but I really liked the record a lot. I thought the songs were really strong and really greatly written. And even though it has that pop influence, I don't view it as like a total sellout pop record, really. Uh, it definitely has touchstones of great songwriting and interesting production values and really creative things that he's doing in the music that bring it to a higher level than just your standard mainstream pop album to me that makes it worthy of this list and I appreciate Stephen Wilson for his ability to experiment and go into different lanes and not just do what all the fans tell him to do, to do his own direction, follow his own muse into what is meaningful to him at the time. So that's my number five. Number four, maybe a bit of a deeper cut, one that maybe some of you don't know about, but maybe many of you do. This is Reina Stolt, uh, his album Wall Street Voodoo, which came out quite a while back. I can't remember the year, but uh, this was a really cool album that I maybe slipped through the cracks a little bit because it wasn't a grand symphonic style album like the Flower Kings. It was more of a of a bluesy classic rock uh, style album. It was I, I think Ryan Stolt just wanted to release an album that wasn't beholden to the prog style that he's known for, where he could branch out a little bit and do something different. And it's not wildly different than his current sound. You know, it still has his signature sound all over it. It still has his signature guitar style and guitar soloing. So it's not wildly out of the realm of, of his own wheelhouse, but it really drifted away from that classic symphonic prog style sound. There aren't big, uh, long epics. There's a few longer tracks that cross the 10 minute mark, but they're more bluesy and more interesting uh, in a classic rock sort of mentality. So it's not this expansive sound that he's known for. So that's why I put on the list. And it has some interesting guests. I think Neil Morse sings on a track or so. So it's a really cool album that I think maybe deserves more attention. At number three on my list, I put Yes and their album 90125. I feel like in the 80s period, Yes drifted away from their progressive rock that made them so famous back in the 70s and did a lot of these 80s style albums that held a lot of influence from the pop uh, rock of the day. And so I feel like this is really the personification of that uh, spirit. And of course, 
like I said, this has touchstones of progressive rock in it. You know, it still has the DNA of Yes that makes them such stalwarts in the genre of progressive rock. So you could argue that this really still is a progressive rock record, but I don't really view it as a prog album because it, it really dabbles in the modern uh, pop landscape. You know, Owner of a Lonely Heart was such a big, massive hit that was on rock and standard radio. You know, so to me, this album really wasn't a progressive rock album anymore it was the band not to say there's anything wrong with that but they were going into a different direction and and performing in a different genre still with those influences there's still tracks that have that progressive influence and you could even call progressive rock tracks Um, but by and large the album to me has more of a pop uh, aesthetic which really brings it into a new genre, in my opinion. So that's why I consider it a non-prog album by prog musicians, but a really, really good, solid one that is one of the strongest in their catalog. So nothing wrong with that. Just thought it was, like I said, I'm stretching it perhaps with this uh, pick, but I think it it makes sense to me because it's a band that was, was changing with the styles of the music of the times and molding into something that fit better into the music landscape at the time, which was moving very far away from the progressive rock that characterized the early to mid-70s. So, uh, yes, 90125. Number two, I'm picking Peter Gabriel. Peter Gabriel 3, which is commonly known as Melt. Uh, Peter Gabriel, to me, that was the first name that that sparked in my brain when I heard non-prog album by prog musician because Peter Gabriel left Genesis, of course, after uh, The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, but went on to do a very cool solo career that maybe wouldn't be classified clearly as prog. He sort of moved away from the big prog that he did with Genesis, but is still has creative artistic influences that still can be classified as progressive in a way, but really isn't in line with the cla- with the capital P prog of the 70s. It's moving in a different direction. It's taking influences from world music and from the pop world and from standard rock and from the 80s style sounds and melding it into something completely new and different. And he was such a popular artist in the 80s due to his uh, experimentation and but still having an accessibility to the sound. I think that really personified uh, his sound really well. Uh, I also thought of Phil Collins in the same uh, breath as well, who did a lot of 80s material um, and beyond, who was a prog musician who really embraced a new style sound. Of course, all the 80s Genesis records as well. But I just prefer Peter Gabriel because he, although he was a pop rock musician perhaps and delved into that space he really still embraced more quirky type styles to his sound and didn't just completely uh, go for these big stadium rock pop hits like what phil collins did i more respect peter gabriel for his artistic integrity even though he was dabbling in different styles of music and i think this record peter gabriel 3 is is really the one that personifies this well where it's a really good straightforward uh rock album but with a lot of experimentation and interesting elements to it that still draws influence from his Uh, more artistic personality so really respect that one and number one maybe a controversial one to stick as number one because it's so recent but I wanted to give a shout out to D. Virgilio Morrison Jennings and the album Troika which I think is a fantastic fantastic record from three musicians who are more known for their progressive rock influences but really put those all aside for an album that's very much more singer-songwriter in the style of Crosby, Stills, and Nash with some really cool three-part harmonies and doing a lot of interesting things in the music, but not nothing progressive really at all. Maybe slight touchstones and something like King for a Day, but really they're embracing their pop rock sensibilities, going back to the 70s singer-songwriter mentality and producing a record that sounds really good, has great musicianship, great vocal harmonies, great blends, and showcases these artists doing something separate from what you know them for in their more prog day jobs. So, so that's the list I have for you guys today. Hopefully you enjoyed my selections. I know they 
We're a little bit off the beaten path this time around, a little bit of an odd selection of albums there, but all ones that I really totally adore and love that I thought fit into this topic pretty well. Please let me know in the description how you interpret this topic and what you would have on your list. I'm sure you guys will have a lot of cool ideas of things I, I missed and didn't think about. So thank you guys once again for joining me on this top five, and I hope to catch you guys in the next top five. Enjoy the music, everybody. Music